for those of you who don't know me, um, as I think Nick mentioned in the introduction, I run the Skyscapes Cosmology and Archaeology module, which used to be known as Archaeostronomy. And I moonlight as an archaeologist. So um, for the past two years, I, my research has been more focused on that than the cultural astronomy side. So instead of give a talk that at least half of you have already seen several times, I just thought I'd do something different, maybe cheating. But to what, I, what I'm going to do is just do an overview of fieldwork projects, student fieldwork projects, uh, over the past six years. So people who have done the archaeostronomy module or the now renamed Skyscapes Cosmology and Archaeology module have had different options, uh, one of which was fieldwork, which we now really emphasize. And so I'm just going to run through what different students have done, how successful they've been, how different approaches to fieldwork are possible. And I don't mean to be inclusive. I can't possibly include all, all student projects. Also, I don't have records for some of that time because I haven't been tutoring this since it started. So, and I know there's some of you in the room who have done the module. Um, and your presentations or your research is not featured, but don't take that as a bad thing. I just had to make choices, and I think the choices will make sense. But first of all, let me just um, talk a bit about what the module is about and how it fits within the MA. And uh, cultural astronomy and astrology, this big umbrella term, the MA teaches it, but there's different types of primary sources that we engage with in the MA. It's textual sources, as we've uh, seen in, in Nick's talk. There's the ethnographic record, which we engage, engage with in the RCC module, for instance, but also the heaven and discourses, for instance. And there's the material records, you know, actual structures, buildings, um, uh, stone tools, uh, mammoth tusks, etc., cave rock art. All of that can come into um, the material record, which is the primary source of archaeology. So this is where the module fits in. Back in 2011, which was the second year of the module, the module handbook described archaeostronomy in the, well, have these three definitions for archaeostronomy. Uh, the first is by Clive Ruggles, a key player in, in archaeostronomy. Um, one could say the father of, of, of modern archaeostronomy. He, he described it as the study of beliefs and practices relating to the sky in the past, especially in prehistory, and the uses to which people's knowledge of the skies was put. Now, this is quite broad, quite general. Many other um, uh, subfields of cultural astronomy and astrology could fit this, this description if we were to just ignore the prehistory bit. Another definition by the Center of Archaeostronomy, which was this important American center. Um, study of astronomical practices, celestial law, mythology, religion, worldviews of all ancient cultures. That's what we call archaeostronomy. So this is an even broader, you know, it includes law, mythology, religion, worldviews. In fact, they like to describe archaeostronomy as the anthropology of astronomy rather than the history of astronomy. But I, I, I suppose that's quite contention. And the Sophia Center in its website describes oops, archaeostronomy as the study of the incorporation of celestial orientation, alignments or symbolism in monuments and architecture. And that is the, the more narrow definition, which is closer to what you find if you simply Google for archaeostronomy or if you pick up a random archaeostronomy paper. It's about how different societies, how different cultures have incorporated their relationship with the sky into the structures they built, whether they were monuments, temples, or whether they were houses, roads, etc. And that's what this module has been about since its inception. The module started off being called Archaeostronomy. It was the only module, it still is the only module of its kind in the world. It started in 2010. It was taught by Kim, which you see in the photo, and Nick, who you know. And Kim has been a key player in the field for many years. Uh, he's done extensive field work all over the world, um, all of which is, has been published. He's done, in particular, if you were here two years ago, he, he gave a couple of talks in the summer school. He has done very important work in Nafta Playa in the western desert, south, south, sorry, southeastern desert of Egypt. Uh, Machu Picchu, other Peruvian sites, also India. But perhaps more, um, he's more famous for his work in the American Southwest, in particular, 
Chapel Canyon, which um, is where this photo was taken. After doing some measurements and some quick maths, uh, Kim predicted that the moon every 18.6 years would rise from Chaco Canyon, from the Great House in Chaco Canyon. The moon would be seen to rise in between these two pillars. This he, done, he did with maths, and he had to wait, I think, six or seven years to actually get the evidence, to get the photograph that proved the point. And this is a, an important aspect of fieldwork. It's not about the maths. You can, you can get proof via photography, via experience. You can go to a, to a site on a particular day, and you will see the relationship between the site and the sky, just like everybody who spent last night at Stonehenge to witness summer solstice sunrise this morning. And that's why the first uh, student that I am going to... Now, I didn't touch anything here. That's the oh, it's back. Did you push anything there? No, no, I didn't push this one, but... Anyway, I'll try not to do it again. So, the first person I'm going to talk about is Tori. Tori's not here, he's coming in later, it doesn't matter. The point is that um, Tori was one of the, of the first cohort in the module back in 2010. And his approach was very much inspired by what I just mentioned about Kim and, and, and photography. So Tori was doing work, as I'm sure you know, in the temple of Nidra in Malta. And most of his, or the emphasis of his research was on photography, on actually going to the sites on particular days, in this case, equinox sunrise and summer solstice sunrise, and experiencing the site, seeing the interaction of the stones with the sun, with the, la the light cast by the sun and the shadows that it creates inside. <coughs> So this is a temple, this is a prehistoric temple, about uh, 5,000 years old. This is the entrance, you're outside looking in, and the light of the equinox sun basically casts this um, shaft that goes all the way to the back of, uh, of the temple there. And then, of course, every day uh, in the year, this shaft of light is going to be moving, and then on summer sources, it's going to be diagonally across this entrance, but it still illuminates a particularly important stone there. So Tori made some very important observations. He also did measurements, because that's uh, a part of the skill set that you'll learn in the module. But the proofs speak a lot. Uh, the pictures speak uh, more than the measurements, I would say. Tori continued to work on this topic. As I'm sure you know, we did it for his MA dissertation, which was published as a master monograph from the Ski Center Press. Uh, high price for the book that I took from the back cover, but you see it's highly biased. Uh, it's Kim, <laughs> myself, and Ruben Griemer, who is an archaeologist in Malta, who is now Torres' um, supervisor. He's now doing a PhD at the University of Malta. I'm also his co-supervisor. But um, So Torres continues to do research on cosmology in Maltese prehistoric temple period. So. Even though he wasn't expecting to fall in love with fieldwork, he did, and he continues to do that, and that's his life now. He lives in Malta. Um, the second person I'm going to feature, also from this um, initial cohort, is Liz Henty. Liz did her module research on three recumbent stone circles in Scotland. This is what they look like. Oh, um, sorry, you can't really see it. There's stone there, a stone there, another stone there, another one there and two more over here. So this is like a panoramic shot from the center of a stone circle. There will be a few more stones around you. And this is just a close-up of what we call the recumbent, which is this stone that is lying and with these two flankers to either side. And there's hundreds of them in Scotland, and they are, again, Neolithic, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age. They're quite old, uh, so that's about 4,000 years old, four to five. And Liz, again, she went on to three sites. She read all the literature on these sites. Uh, lots of research done by Alexander Tom, by Clive Ruggles and others. And uh, her focus was on comparing the different theories that have been applied to these sites. And she went on to 
extend this to six other sites, to a total of nine for her dissertation. And um, she continued to take on this more theoretical approach. How have different people been looking at the sites? What have they been saying about the sites? There's this paper that Liz eventually published, uh, which is freely available online. I'm sorry, you can't really see the reference there. Um, it's called Archistronomy of Tom Neviri Recumbent Stone Circle, a comparison of methodologies, which, which is quite a, it's a very, in my view, it's a very important paper in archaeostronomy. which is just comparing different approaches to one particular site, which is the opposite of what archaeostronomers tend to do, because they tend to measure many sites and then just do maths and statistics on it. And they kind of lose track of what the sky is actually doing there. Liz is a PhD candidate. She is working on this research question of whether archaeostronomy has a role to play in British prehistory. So she's still interested in the more theoretical aspect of it, in this case more historical, I would say. Uh, and she's also co-editor of the Journal of Skyscape Archaeology with myself. So again, another example, Liz fell in love with, with archaeostronomy, with fieldwork, and she has continued to do that, even though she's now more focused on more theoretical things. Um, Right, then I have a gap in my record, so I'm going to jump uh, three years uh, into the future. And that's just because I also was doing the module in 2010, and then I had the MA to finish, and it was only after that that I really became involved as a tutor. So I don't have all the projects from in between 2010 and 2013. So just another example, Melanie, who is now doing her dissertation, for the module, she did work on a um, site, I'm sorry that's cut, that was the quick conversion to PowerPoint I had to do in the last five minutes. Um, yeah, I can't remember what he's supposed to say, but it's about this site, Magdalenburg in Germany, and she was comparing and discussing how archeologists and archeoastronomers have looked at the same evidence. Not that different from what Liz did, but perhaps more, um, focused because it's a single site, it's a very complex site with wild, wildish claims, as you can see here. Yeah. It's a bit, um, sorry it's out of focus, but you can see that there, the black dots correspond to burials. This is a mound, this is a burial mound, you've seen it from above. The black dots correspond to burials, Burials that have a certain orientation, because it's an entire body. And then these black lines correspond to wooden structures. And you can see that Mies has suggested, by connecting the burial, by connecting the dots in this way, he suggests that the northern constellations are here represented. We got Ursa Major here, Draco there, uh, Ursa Minor, etc. And that particular uh, rows of posts would then be aligned with summer solstice sunset, winter solstice sunrise, as well as the important lunar rises and sets. And the archaeologists don't believe this. And it's easy to see why. Because this is what the site looks like. Now if you look at this archaeological plan, can you see Ursa Major in there when you look at it? No. I mean there's a, almost there's an infinite number of ways you could connect these dots to get Ursa Major and everything you want. So, you know, this is really just um, ethnographic, ethnocentric projection. You're projecting the constellations into this. I mean, it's easier to see Ursa Major in the sky because at least the stars have different magnitudes and you just focus on the, on, on the brightest ones. Then it is here when everything is exactly the same. Now, this is a representation of the site, so you know it doesn't really capture what the site is about. But it does show that there's something curious going on here. Melody, Melanie also made some very interesting and new observations about the site itself. And she went on to publish this work in Spiker. Um, that one, 3-1, 2015, you can download it, you know what Spiker is, I'm sure. And she's now finishing her dissertation, which is not on this site. It's not even a prehistoric site. It's Gallo-Roman. It's uh, Augusta Rorica, which is in Switzerland, and she's exploring it in relation to the landscape and the skyscape. But I, I don't want to preempt any uh, of her results because she's just about to submit. The point I'm trying to make is that 
there's different approaches to fieldwork. There's different ways of doing fieldwork. There's different levels of engagement with the, the site. But the key thing is that you need to try to establish a dialogue with the site so that you will then understand the people who built it and their relationship to the sky. And it was with this in mind that last year we revised the module completely from the ground up. It's now called Skyscapes, Cosmology and Archaeology. It was first taught last year. This change was in line with the academic zeitgeist in archaeoastronomy that we are actually and actively promoting and developing. So, for instance, it, it followed the publication of Skyscapes, Role and Importance of the Sky in Archaeology that Nick and I edited, which itself was uh, the proceedings of a session in an archaeological conference that we organized, where we introduced this idea of skyscape. Bernadette has a paper there, Tori has a paper there, Liz, etc. And then Liz and myself developed the journal of Skyscape Archaeology again as a place for people to publish this sort of, um, pub of uh, research. And now in the module, whereas originally fieldwork was not mandatory, so I've, I've shown you only a few cases, there were many more, but um, other students would opt not to do fieldwork, we've now made it mandatory, although two variants are offered. You can either go to a site, which could be any site, you know, it could be your local church, as I'm going to show you next. It could be an ancient magnificent site like Stonehenge, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, it could be uh, just uh, the streets of your city grid, like Manhattan, for instance. A different variant is to do experimental archaeoastronomy, where you reconstruct, say, Stonehenge in your backyard, to scale, obviously, not, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. And then you can play with light and shadows with, um, with a compass to do measurements, make sure that your mini Stonehenge is aligned correctly, and then, you know, um, play with that to try to get a feel for what the site would have been like in the past, because today it looks very different. Um, and test, experimentally test some hypotheses about the site, rather than just argue about the site. Since we changed the module, uh, uh, it's only been running, this is the second year, so there's not that many um, student projects I can showcase. But I want to showcase a few from last year. The first of which is Rafael. Rafael's not here, unfortunately. But he's done something which was new. No one has ever done this in the module. He did a 3D model reconstruction of Glastonbury Abbey in the proper landscape and skyscape. And he used it to play with, to experiment with, to try to find something about it. So this is, this is all he's doing. He basically went to the site, he took measurements, he bought books about it, reconstruction um, images, pictures, uh, the ground plans, and he built this from the ground up. That's Glastonbury Abbey. That's the tour right there. And you can see there's an alignment here. A line joining the Abbey Church, the Peaks of the Tor, and Chalice Hill. So, you know, he basically built the tools to then look at the landscape. Is there a connection? Well, it turns out that from the site of the Abbey Church, you could actually see the sun rising during the equinox on top of the Tor. And that's fantastic. I mean, you know, this is computer generated, it looks a bit pixelated. Um, and today, I don't think you can see this because there's buildings on the way, but this would have been visible um, in the medieval times. But it was not only outside, he also looked inside the church. So this is his reconstruction of the church. And here is a comparison of a photograph, photographic evidence, with his simulation, his 3D simulation of the church. Those three windows are there. And this is the light shining through the windows on a particular time and date. And this is the simulation of that. So you have here the light of those windows illuminating the floor here, which is the same. So it's just a different perspective. So this was kind of a test to see if his model was accurate, which is a good thing to do. And having done this, having established that his model is accurate and he can play with light and shadow and windows, he then just started exploring it putting some random dates, well, not random, you know, the, the key dates, summer solstice, equinoxes, and Celtic calendar dates, etc. 
um, letting the sun move through the sky on those days and then just looking at it. Look, look within the church and see where the light is hitting. And one of his many interesting results was that the site of King Arthur's grave, where supposedly King Arthur was found, was illuminated by one of these windows. Well, in the morning, not exactly at sunrise, but in the morning of summer solstice. These are two views of the same thing, one from above and one from the floor. So the light would be shining directly above King Arthur's tomb, something that no one has ever noticed before because obviously the church is a ruin now. The, the abbey itself is a ruin. There's basically a couple of walls, as you can see there. A different project by Grace, although similar in that it was uh, also related to churches or chapels in this case. Just to, it, I've decided to include it because it illustrates that all of us can do field work because wherever you are, there is a chapel around you. There is. A structure, however modern as it might be, it's doable. It's 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 proper fieldwork. So what she did was she picked a couple of medieval chapels in Malta, Grace's Maltese, and uh, she just did fieldwork. The the whole skill set that she, that uh, we teach in the module. So she went there. She measured the orientation of the church. She went through a series of of problems because it's a modern building. There's, uh, it's, I mean, it's in use. There's electricity wires. There's copper wires that copper pipes that influence the compass. But all of those things can be dealt with. And she explored it in relation to the sky and the landscape. Of course, the landscape is not available because there's modern buildings around. But there's tools, easy to use websites that you can just put in the latitude and longitude of your site, and it shows you what the landscape would have looked like without buildings, without trees, without anything. And she identified some possibly some possible connections between the orientation of these churches and uh, risings and settings of particularly bright stars in the medieval um, period. She is now, even though, as she told me, she was very um, cautious and, and, and um, afraid of fieldwork, she, she fell in love with it, and she's now doing a dissertation on um, a major site. You know, she started small, local, and now she, she, she's doing a major archaeological site in, in um, Andalusia, in Spain, um, the Madinat Azahara, which was a city built from the ground up by the first Cordovan Caliph, Abd al Rahman III. This was in 940 or thereabouts AD. Uh, and you can see it's a major site, with, which obviously has its other challenges. So I, I'm quickly um, drawing to a conclusion here. The point I'm trying to make is that um, module students have went above and beyond what was required of the module. And they have now presented at international conferences like INSEP and SEAC. Uh, INSAP is the Inspiration for Astronomical Phenomenon. SEAC is the um, European uh, Society of Astronomy and Culture, which is really the meeting for RQ astronomers, the yearly meeting for RQ astronomers. They've presented at the sessions we've organized of the Theoretical Archaeology Group, uh, the National Astronomy Meeting, which is happening next week in Nottingham, and Bernadette and I are going to be there. Uh, and just to give you a quantitative idea, in 2010, SEAC, <laughs> In Munich, there were two student presentations, even though there were a couple other students involved. And of course, there was Nick, and I think it was just you. I don't think no. In Gilsing, it was just it was just us. But this year, twelve current or past students are presenting, some of which are in the room. Um, that's one fifth of all the speakers, and this is a week-long conference, so we're slowly taking over, um, which is a good thing. And it's good. I mean, it means the module is working. It's, it's creating good, high-quality research that is based, mostly based on fieldwork. But it's not just the student projects that have been using the, the tool set of archaeostronomy. We also have the Welsh Monastic Skyscapes project that uh, the three of us, Darlene, uh, Bernadette, Darlene, and myself, 
have been um, involved in since the summer of 2014. It feels like it was just yesterday <laughs> that we went out there. Uh, the idea of the project is to um, explore the relationship between the Welsh monasteries and the landscape and the skyscape. As you can see here, this is Valle Crucius, which is actually what um, Rafael is doing now for his dissertation. So he's building up these walls and doing a similar thing to what he did with Glass and the Abbey. Um, as, and as you can see, um, this sits in a deep valley with mountains all around. And previous research on medieval churches, not in Wales, mostly in England, have kind of ignored that these sites exist in a living landscape, a, a, a non-flat landscape. They were looking at sunrises and sunsets as if there were no mountains around it. But of course there are mountains, and that delays sunrise, and it, and it anticipates sunset. So we've been look. We've done field work on 23. Well, you've done a few more now. Yeah. It's about uh, 28. Yeah. yeah. Lots of cows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, sites all over Wales, from north to south, east to west. Um, and we doing. We're also doing a slightly different approach to what is usually done. So instead of using statistics, because uh, from the get-go we could easily show that that doesn't work in this case we are looking at them individually and looking at the histories um, and looking at the measurements that we got and how what they are telling us about uh, the people who built these monasteries a second project that i am running um prehistoric skyscapes of western iberia it's it's related to what i've been doing ever since i did the module back in 2010 and it's exploring the prehistoric passage graves in Portugal and Spain, mostly Portugal. Uh, that's just one example. And you've, you've heard me talk about this many times, so I, I, I don't want to spend too much time there. But the idea is similar. The idea is to try to understand what was the connection between these prehistoric 6,000-year-old um, societies and the sky by looking at the, these monuments. Uh, the key aim here, as far as I'm concerned, has actually been to develop a new methodology, a more careful methodology, um, rather than the uh, rough and ready uh, approach to measurement that had been done by previous scholars. Um, and just to conclude, let's see if this works. Maybe this won't be captured by Panopto, but um, I've, I've done a map on Google Maps with all the different uh, research projects for, for students. Oh, I can see that on my screen, but you can't. Easily fixed. There we go. Mm -hmm. Just so you see how wide um, the MA has moved. The red dots correspond to module research projects and the purple ones to dissertations that involved uh, archaeological fieldwork. And the uh, regions in colour represent the staff research projects. So there's the Welsh Monastic Skies and there's uh, my prehistoric skyscapes. And we can see it's mostly, it, there's a huge focus here in the UK or, or Western Europe, I would say. But, you know, we have a project in Belize, Canada, Hawaii, Mecca. Um, the island of Delos in Greece. There's still gaps to fill in, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're getting there, I suppose. So, yeah, that's it. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>